Hello and welcome to episode number 553 of Smart Podcast Trashy Books. I'm Sarah Wendell and my guest today is Kelly Farmer. This was originally episode number 537. This is an episode that I didn't run due to the HarperCollins union strike. Kelly and I recorded this episode in October 2022 in anticipation of her book, Calling the Shots. And I've held on to the episode now that the strike is settled. I can release it and I am very excited to share this with you. I want to thank Kelly Farmer for her understanding and for her support of the HarperCollins union strike. Kelly is the author of the Out on the Ice series of hockey romances and a former improvisational actor. So we're going to talk about how improv exercises and techniques influence and improve writing. So if you're stuck with your writing project, maybe this will help. Also, I learned to say Megan Rapinoe's name correctly, which is a win for everyone involved. Hello and thank you to our Patreon community. If you have supported the show with a monthly pledge, well, you're keeping me going and you're making sure that every episode has a transcript from Garlic Knitter. Hi, Garlic Knitter. Thank you so much for your support. And if you would like to join, if you like the show, have a look at patreon.com slash smart bitches. Monthly pledges start at a dollar a month and we have a very jolly, wonderful, warm, welcoming discord. We have bonus episodes. We have lots of fun stuff. So have a look. And thank you again, Patreon community. Hello, especially to Roxana, who is one of our newest patrons. Hi, welcome. This episode is brought to you in part by Athletic Greens. I tried AG1 because I like having a nutritional drink, especially when I'm short on time or traveling or off my normal eating schedule. And the all-in-one formula makes it so easy for me to cover my nutritional bases every day. AG1 is powerful because it's so easy. I take AG1 after a workout or after a walk, and it feels really good to know I'm making sure I have all the vitamins. AG1 is a daily habit with excellent benefits. You can mix it with ice water, but I like to add it to yogurt or toss it into a smoothie to boost my nutrition in one step. Why take a bunch of different things when you can just mix one scoop of powder once a day? It's the healthiest thing that you can do under a minute. AG1 has been part of millions of mornings since 2010, and it was designed with ease in mind. In fact, it's delivered every month, which makes it incredibly convenient and good for me because I never know what day it is. With AG1, I'm taking good care of my body, and it's really, really simple. If you are looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash Sarah. That's athleticgreens.com slash Sarah. Check it out. This episode is brought to you in part by Fast Growing Trees. Spring is arriving very early in my area this year, and some of the plants that I ordered from Fast Growing Trees last year are already showing new leaves. You can breathe some life into your backyard with fastgrowingtrees.com this spring. From shade to fruit to privacy and natural beauty, Fast Growing Trees can help you plant your dream garden with their expert advice and fast, reliable shipping. Last year, I bought two hydrangeas from Fast Growing Trees, and I am so excited to see them bloom this year. One is a miniature wedding bouquet hydrangea that I had in our yard in New Jersey, and I never thought I would find it again. Each blossom looks like a miniature wedding bouquet, and I love seeing it bloom each year. This year, I think I want to install some taller evergreen privacy trees along our back fence. And with fast growing trees, it's so easy to identify the right plant for my climate and the location in my yard. And with their 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee, I know everything will be healthy for years to come. I've even told my neighbors about fast-growing trees, and they've ordered their own plants. One neighbor ordered cherry trees, which should be very delicious, very soon. Join over 1.5 million happy fast-growing trees customers. Go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash Sarah now and get 15% off your entire order. Get 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash Sarah. Are you ready to get started with this show? The correct answer is yes, and. (laughs) Yes, and. We're going to do a podcast about improv. On with the podcast. Hello, everyone. (laughs) My name is Kelly Farmer, and uh, I am the author of Queer Contemporary Romance. It's mostly sapphic or women-loving women. Uh, I currently have the Out on the Ice series available. It is set in the women's professional hockey world. Uh, The first two books are out uh, now. It's Unexpected Goals came out last year. That was the second book. And the first book uh, that started it all off is called Out on the Ice. Uh, And then the third book in the series, Calling the Shots, is coming out on November 15th. Excellent. Out on the Ice is the one with the Megan Rapinoe lookalike on the cover, right? Yes. God bless that cover model stock image 
model person gal. Funny that when I like first saw the like original cover concept that showed up on my inbox at work and like I clicked on it and I literally screamed out loud, oh my God, it's Megan Rapino. <laughs> I've been saying her name wrong for years. Oh my gosh. I, I did too. Ah, thank you. <laughs> I did thank too. you for that. And I was, I, I'm with you. I also said Rapino. I said like everything but Rapino. Yeah. Well, this is what happens when I read a word without hearing it. I don't listen to a lot of sports coverage because talking is very distracting for me. I read most things. So I, if I read it, then I just assume my brain is right. So thank you. (laughs) You must have been beside yourself when you saw the cover. It was really cool. So when it's your debut novel, you never quite know what you're going to get. And you just, you've been dreaming of a cover for a long time in my case. And uh, it it was just very cool to to see. Actually, here's a fun fact. Um, On the cover, originally, like she has purple hair going down the middle. Mm -hmm. She was completely bald, like on the sides. It wasn't like an undercut. It was she was bald and like, it was very like bald um, and didn't fit the character. So the, um, the cover artist actually like drew in hair. No way. Yeah. Oh, it, that's you can't so, tell you all. can't tell at all. That's so funny. And now you have an illustrated cover for calling the shots. Yeah. Was that, that was, a marketing that decision? I think it was on, um, you know, my, I'm published with Karina Press and you know, they, they make those decisions because they know the market. Mm -hmm. Um, I had, you know, they had been doing some really cute illustrated covers and I was sort of like, Oh, if that's the direction you want to go, I'm not going to say no. Like I've, I've loved those covers since they were first popular, like ages ago, like back in the day when chiclet was was an actual term that publishers used. And, um, so I always kind of wanted one. And so, um, when I saw that this one was illustrated, I got very, very excited because it's cute. It's, it's very, very cute. cute. I love that there's a woman in a suit on it because that's one of the cool things in this book is they're both um, rival head coaches. So I get to have a lot of women in suits. And, and let's be honest, that women in suits is like, oh, women that's in an suits okay is, thing. Women in suits is awesome. Yeah. At my, uh, at my sister-in-law's wedding, I was a bridesmaid. This was in 2019. For the record, I'm too old to be a bridesmaid. And my husband <laughs> was a groomsman. And um, in order to sort of break the ice at the reception and to be very silly, before we were introduced with all the bridal party, uh, we went upstairs and switched clothes. So he put on my bride, my, my bridesmaid's dress and I put on his tux and I did not want to give it back. It was comfy. Yeah. I looked great. I had pockets for years, a year's worth of pockets. I could have just packed up everything I brought in the suit. It was, I had so many pockets. I did not want to give it back. I love suits. Suits are awesome. Yeah. And, um, you know, he said, yeah, like a fancy suit, you know, a woman in a tux suit is just. With a vest? Oh, yes. Oh, well, I have to say Tierney, um, one of the, one of the main characters in the, in Calling the Shots, likes to wear three-piece suits, which drives Regan rather crazy. Yeah, I bet. I bet. (laughs) So tell me what people will find inside Calling the Shots. What is your sort of pitch for this book? It is a sweet second chance-ish romance. Uh, As I said, between rival pro women's hockey coaches. Uh, We have uh, Regan Lane, who is a former superstar player. You would say she's the Megan Rapinoe of women's hockey. Like she's very outspoken, has always been pushing for equity in women's athletics and um, we, of course, have to pair her up with somebody who is an ice queen. So I have Tierney McGovern, who is, um, she's a single mom. She has some serious trust issues. So she likes to keep everyone at bay, which, of course, uh, has Reagan wanting to bust down that wall and just like, I'm just going to charm you until <laughs> until the wall comes down. There's also cameos from the characters in the first two books in the series because you know you have to bring back the 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 former couples to see how they're doing obviously and um and there's also a lot of tv show references they watch a lot of tv do they well i i do so (laughs) (laughs) so i had to throw in some like ted lasso references winona earp legends of tomorrow it's kind of 
kitchen sink. So why do you think hockey is such a popular romance setting? I know so many people that are into hockey romance. I have staff reviewers who absolutely love it. And I've noticed that hockey is a setting for all of the various pairings, whether it's hetero or sapphic or queer or pan. Hockey is a really popular setting. And usually like when I look at the genre after sort of thinking about it for years now, I can usually come up with a theory like, oh, it makes sense. That's popular because of this. I have no theory about hockey. I cannot figure it out. Like, I'm glad it is. I don't have a problem with it. But I'm always curious, since you write in the genre, why do you think hockey is a popular romance setting? And why did you pick it? I think, like, as an overall why it's popular would be that hockey players are really tough. That's true. There's an inbuilt strength there, isn't it? I would say, you know, and certainly not to disparage any other sport, because... Every every athlete can kick my butt. <laughs> uh, but like hockey players, you know, they'll like take a puck to the face and be like, stitch me up. I got to go back. They'll break their leg. They'll play on like, you know, sprained, strained things and broken appendages. And they'll just keep playing. And that's just, you know, like they are they are tough. Doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman or non-binary. Like they are tough players. That's true. And I also think that um, the team, the team mentality and the camaraderie is really, really strong in hockey. Like, you know, being a team player, standing up for your teammates, you know, like, I mean, there's, there's fighting in professional men's hockey, like that's how badly they stick up for each other. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So there's that. um, Not only is the mentality there of like, well, yeah, we're all in this together. We're a family. Um, But in terms of romance, whenever you set anything on a team, you like instantly give yourself a series. That's true. The sequel bait all the way down. Yeah. Because I mean, you introduce book one with like, hey, here's this group. And you introduce some characters. And then of course, like, as a writer, there's always that character who just kind of like bursts onto the scene. And it's like, so. Yes. Here and it's I am. fun Please. to write them and their dialogue just comes so easily and they just chew on the scenery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, that's the one you go, well, I guess you're going to need a book, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess you're next. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So for me, why I wanted to write in women's hockey is because it's that one's not represented very much in romance. No. Um, I, I did a deep dive, you know, on Amazon and Googled, and I think I've come up with like less than 20 Mm -hmm. period. So we definitely need more. So if you're a writer listening to this, please write women hockey players. We need more of them. Um, and you know, in terms of like female, female romance, it happens all the time. Oh yeah. Half the Canadian hockey team is married. The American hockey team. They just keep getting married. They do. And it's adorable. It's so cute. Their stories are cute. And um, also, like, particularly since there's a lot of cross-border romances, there's such a huge rivalry between the Canadian women's hockey team and the American women's hockey team. Yeah, just a tiny bit. Just a bit, yeah. Um, But it's, I mean, it's it's such an interesting dynamic because, like, they all know each other. They work together at, you know, colleges or universities or at hockey camps. It's not a big so world, is it? Other. Yeah. Like it's such a commingled world, like yeah. outside of the national teams. Yeah. But then like once you get to the national teams, it's like we are enemies. We hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, bye, honey. I'll see you in a month. Love you. Going to kill you on the ice. Yep. <laughs> For this season, we hate each other. Then we'll move in again after the season's over and it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a dynamic that I'm like, wow. I mean, that one, that was actually the very first idea that I had is like, oh, it should be a cross-border romance. But that ended up being the second book in the series, Unexpected Goals, Yeah, is a Canadian goalie and an American forward. And they had a very public clash at the 2018 Olympics. And um, so then, of course, they become teammates in the women's pro league. Awkward. And, yeah, real awkward. <laughs> and and that is a very familiar trope. Like we had a conflict elsewhere and now we have to work together. That is very common. I don't know if there's a shorthand word for that, but that's very, very common. And you're right. Creating hockey players as characters comes with uh, a unique skill set, a very small 
world in terms of the sport itself. And then just there's an inbuilt strength. These are very strong people who go very fast and do a very hard sport. Yeah. I mean, just imagine, like I learned how to play hockey as an adult. Like a lot of people have asked me, oh, do you play hockey? And I always have to say, well, in the most basic sense of the word, yes, I can technically play it. But like I could ice skate pretty well and I played floor hockey for a number of years. So I could do both of them separately. I could. <laughs> but like when you put them together, it's hard. Oh, it's like, very hard. Very, very feet hard. You're going this way. The puck is going that way. And you're like, oh, oh, wait, 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 I got to get to it. And it's it's hard. So like they're basically doing everything other athletes do, but on ice. Yep. And it's very fast. Like you, you your reaction, the reaction time of hockey players on the ice is just off the charts fast. Yeah. It's, you know, there's just so much to pay attention to and you never quite know where the puck is going to bounce. Yep. You know, like it, it, you know, it can take one funny bounce and then just. Blink. I'm always impressed when I watch hockey because I grew up in Pittsburgh. So, and I grew up in the, in Pittsburgh in the nineties when oh, the penguins yeah. were at the very top. And if it wasn't football, it was hockey. I was always impressed that the cameraman can find the puck. I know, right? Like, how do you, I can't see it. How do you see it? You got a big camera in front of your face. How are you doing that? I, I've always been impressed that the camera can find it, let alone the players. <laughs> I am super, super impressed with the commentators. Oh yeah. Especially like play by play. Yeah. And they're just like, this guy, this guy, this guy. And it's like, wow, how, how, how? are you doing that? Right. And also <laughs> like the numbers are blurry for me, sir. I, I can't yeah. see the numbers. How do you see them? It's incredible. Now, you mentioned when you emailed me that you use acting and improv techniques in your writing. And I think this is so very cool. How did your background in acting influence and inform your writing? Well, it was funny. When I like sat down as a grown up to like write a book <laughs> for <laughs> realsies you know, this yeah. time, for realsies, not the, like the ones I started in junior high. Yeah. Um, I, I realized to kind of as I was doing it that I was using a lot of the same basic character work that actors do, uh, there's, there's just a ton of overlap because, you know, you're creating worlds and people. And um, so I think that the biggest one is probably motivation. Mm. Like, why is my character doing this? Mm -hmm. And as an actor, you have to take the text and decide why is this character behaving this way or saying this or doing this? Um, and even things like, when you enter or exit a scene, you have to enter with purpose. Yes. That's like, you can't just wander on, like you have to be entering the stage or the screen for a reason. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, in terms of writing, that helps with why is this character in this scene? Does this character need to be in this scene? I have a problem with a lot of too many characters in my scenes. But you got a whole so, team. I got a whole team. You got a whole team. And you got to know all their motivations. Up. Yeah, you're setting yourself up for some headaches when you write team sport books. You know, there, I think the character work is a big part of it. But then there's also just the, the little things like blocking in terms mm -hmm. of like, I don't know if you've ever seen a play or like a movie or a TV show where if you just sit there and talk to each other, that's very boring. Oh, um, yes. So you have to, yeah, you have to like get up and move around, you know, <laughs> which is like... Yeah. In in in, the, in theater, you know, like in rehearsals and stuff, sometimes you just be sitting there a long time. And if you're working with a good director, you can turn to the director and be like, "Can I get up here?" Like, yeah, I feel like I need to get up. I'm there needs to be some sort of dynamic presence in addition to the words. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and there's also things like levels, like who has the power in the scene. Um, in terms of if two people are sitting, you're equal. But if one is standing and one is sitting then the standing person is the power. And, um, you know, little thing, props, setting, yeah, you know, like we're <laughs> making sure my characters aren't existing in a void. <laughs> I mean, seems seems important. Yeah, it, it is. And that's certainly something I, I love writing dialogue, like dialoguers for me is my jam. So oh, yeah, I'll write too. like a screenplay and then go back and be like, now where are they? <laughs> I should maybe mention... This is a kitchen. <laughs> I remember reading, I think it was an author, I think it was Jim Hines, rereading one of his oldest books that he, maybe he's a story that he wrote like in high school or something. And I remember him saying on Twitter as he was rereading and critiquing his own work, 
It's like my characters are just walking around on a whiteboard. There's just nothing there. They're just two stick figures in a whiteboard having a conversation. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've totally read things like that. I've written things like that. Yeah. But, it, but it's interesting when you when you think about the motivation and the action of characters in terms of acting, the setting and the set are part of the world. And so as a writer, you have to include that, too. Oh, that's I hadn't even thought of it that way, but that's absolutely true. Yeah. And for certain books, the setting becomes another character. Oh, it's my uh, favorite and, thing. Yeah. So what improv techniques do you use with your writing? What are some of the improv exercises that have really helped your writing? I think that is such an interesting idea and definitely is going to create a more dynamic dialogue for sure. For sure. Um, and it's funny, and um, over the years is what I've talked to, because a lot of writers do have like acting or theater or creative people backgrounds. And a lot of us have said, we, we all do these things. We all use the same techniques. So it's kind of funny that, uh, that we're, we're all out there using this, this knowledge that we, we gained to make our books even better. Yeah. Um, as far as improv, uh, there's, there's three basic rules in improv. Um, they are don't ask questions, no saying no, mm-hmm. and stay in the present moment. Uh, and so for the don't ask questions, um, to get, to give you some improv one on one. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> it's uh, the reason why that's like a no no is because it puts the onus on your partner. Ah, uh, um, yes, they have to come up with the motivation. You're asking them to inform you. Yeah, and it's also it's 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 just rude. Let's be honest, because because if we were improving a scene and I was like, "Hi, Sarah, how are you? What did you have for breakfast? Did you have coffee? Was it ice or cold? Yeah, did you blah 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 blah?" And it, it makes you be like, uh, 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 and, um, well, that's not a conversation. That's an interview. That's, I do those all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is a great way to ask questions. Cause you know, we're ha- we're having a conversation this way, but yes, if, if you're trying to, uh, you know, do an improv scene, this is not so cool. Um, so instead, uh, it, it's about being a team player more so kind of to go back to hockey. Um, it's being a team player, helping your scene partner, and um, also, in, in you you give them an opportunity to offer information to you that you can then take and work with. Um, improv is all about like an energy exchange, and like we're help we're here helping each other. I know when I first started writing, I like had my vision, and I kept trying to like shove them back into the like. But this is the story. Come back, get like, shoving you into story I want to tell. Mm-hmm. And then I finally learned that they're not going to listen to me. Nope. So now I'm just going to let them go. Yep. Go tell tell me your story. Yes. <laughs> and when you've created characters with strong individual voices, which I'm assuming that improv is going to help you do, then they are going to be able to inform you of their own motivations because you've created them with a strong voice. Yes. And they do. Oh, yeah. I've oh, had this experience. Bit. Yes. It, it's very, they very weird. They get very vocal sometimes. Yes. And it's like, okay, why isn't this scene working? Why can't I move forward? And why, why isn't this working? Well, because these people wouldn't do that. And they're mad that, that you did. So back up, right? Or or switch mm-hmm. POV or do something to disrupt the dynamic that I got stuck in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the second one for no saying no, um, basically saying no, just instantly puts a stop to something. Um, this, you know, it's like, oh, let's go to the park. No. Well, okay, great. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, this is kind of where if, if, if you've heard of like the yes and. Yes approach, and, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, where it's like, let's go to the park. Yes. And we'll have a picnic. Yes. And we will look at the clouds and make animals out of them. It it keeps the moves the scene forward, moves the action forward. I actually I honestly use this one in real life quite a bit um, in terms of saying yes and. I used to be a real negative Nelly in my youth, and I realized when you know you start saying yes and, like yeah, it just kind of opens up your world. It builds a more positive interaction because you're not contradicting. And it's really interesting because I think that especially with social media, we are conditioned to disagree and debate and barter in our conversations. And sometimes I just want to be like, yes, that's so cool. Tell me more. Yeah. And that's, that's a great approach. It's like, like you're saying, it opens doors. It, it, it's a more positive spin. Cause you know, 
like you're saying with, with kids, you know, mom, can we go do this? No, we can't today. Like, whereas, well, I'd love to do that. Can we do that on Saturday? Yes, I would love to do this. Let's pick a time where, um, you know, I'm not making dinner and trying to feed the dog and trying to do all this other stuff. But yes, absolutely. Let's yeah. figure this out. Yeah, so that one's, that's a good, a good real life one. But it's also really good for writing, too, because, you know, I, I think it almost ties into the first one of like, okay, you want to, you want to go there, characters? Okay. Or, like, all right, let's, uh, we're going to talk about that now, like in um, something I've been recently working on, which is a little bit of a secret. So I can't talk about it, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I have these sibling characters who just started riffing on dirty, dirty jokes. And I was <laughs> like, okay, this is your relationship. Like, I love this for you. <laughs> So like that, that just became a lot of fun. And it was just something that was like, okay, we're going this direction. Didn't know that was your relationship, but okay. That's how it is. Okie dokie. Yeah. And then um, the third one is stay in the present moment. This is a really good one for writing um, because it helps you not wander into backstory land or oh, info dumping. Yes. As you know, Bob. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, cause we're so excited about these characters that we've made up and we've made up their whole life stories. And we really want to tell you about that time in fifth grade, but you know, and, uh, but the present moment of your story is like, you know, some action adventure story where someone's dangling off a cliff, like maybe <laughs> don't talk about remember in fifth grade, you know, you do have to like dip a toe into backstory. Yes. And so it, it helps me like look through and be like, okay, have I gotten to far out of the present moment. Yes, like, absolutely. How is this information relevant to the present moment? Does this does this need to be said? Does this need to be said now? Does this need to be mm -hmm. said by this character? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's really interesting. Yes. And it, it seems like using improv techniques when you're developing character, both it, it takes care of so many things at the same time. It builds character backstory for you because of motivation. Yeah it builds a, an active dynamic scene in the present and it creates conversation. And as a person who likes to read all the dialogue, hello, that is the best part. It's like I'm eavesdropping on interesting people talking about interesting things. Yeah, I, I love writing the dialogue too. I love reading the dialogue. <laughs> I love all the dialogue. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I love looking at older things that I've written and I'm like, my God, this is a lot of paragraphs of exposition. When are these people going to start talking? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's one of those, you know, the hints they tell you, like, look for the indents. Oh, yeah. You know, if if you don't see a lot of indents in your, on your page. Not a lot of dialogue. Nope. But yeah, there's a lot of paragraph happening there. <laughs> and it's interesting because the current um, trends in romance, there's a really big group of people that love first person and sometimes first person present. And there's people who like third person or third person very close where you're in third person, but you know all of that person's, you know, arteries and veins and stuff. And the, the people who read them sometimes have very strong feelings about one over the other. And I have to say, if the dialogue is good, I stop noticing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, for me, I'm kind of the same way. Like I, I'm a big believer in a story needs to be told the way it needs to be told, whatever... Yeah whatever that is. And, you know, yeah, if it's told in a compelling way, if the dialogue is good, mm -hmm. if, if it's not wandering into, like I said, into internal thoughts while you're in a conversation. Yeah. Like, so what books are you reading that you want to tell people about? I am just finishing up the Black Love Matters anthology. Ooh, how are you liking it? Oh my God. I, it, honestly, it needs to be required reading for everyone in <laughs> Romance Landia. Like, period. I, I have learned a lot. I have felt a lot. Um, the uh, so Jessica Pride uh, is the like editor of it, mm -hmm. and um, they just did a great job having a lot of different uh, backgrounds and experiences, and um, you know, people from all walks of life in their personal lives as well as their publishing lives. It's really good. It's really good. It's. I just want everyone to read this book. Please read this book. <laughs> Romance Landia will become a thousand times better if everyone reads this book. I get it. I absolutely get it. Um, uh, I'm also uh, currently. I'm currently reading Satisfaction Guaranteed. 
right? Corelius Tut's Waters. Yeah, I'm I'm always very behind on books. So, <laughs> so I finally got to this one. I'm enjoying it quite a bit. There is a very strong opposites tract, grumpy sunshine thing happening, which is a lot of fun. Um, and there's some there's some fun secondary characters. So I'm I'm enjoying that one. And I will I will give a plug also for a recent finish. Um, if you if you're looking for a holiday-ish book that's it's definitely set during like Thanksgiving Christmas, um, but it's not like Christmas vomit. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Christmas. Seashells and Sleigh Bells by Jenny Davids. And it came out last year and um it's just it's like a warm hug. It's a, it's a really sweet book, and I loved the ending. Really, oh, the ending is so like, like that's what I want for my HEA right there. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> well, my theory is always that a book that you haven't read is a new book. It doesn't always matter when it came out. It's it's a new book, so if it's last year, it's still available, and it's in Kindle Unlimited. What more do you need? Yeah, I great, mean. awesome. <laughs> Can't you you can't talk about what you're working on, right? That's all that's all secret. I can say that I'm a part of the Happily Ever After Collective. Ooh, cool. Yeah. It's it's this really neat uh, subscription service on Patreon. Uh it's got, I want to say like 40, 40 ish uh authors. And I mean, there are some authors in it that I'm literally kind of like looking over both shoulders, like, wait, I'm in this group too. <laughs> <laughs> How did this happen? Uh, it's, it's super cool. Every month, uh, we release four brand new novellas and they're all centered around the same trope. Yeah. So like fake relationship, enemies to lovers, siblings, best friend. Um, I do have a novella in it. I cannot tell you what month cause that's the secret, but I can't say it hasn't come out yet. So, <laughs> so it is a month in the future. It is a future month. Okay. That, that you will get my fun novella. Well, that's awesome. And it is really an amazing thing, the, the collective, isn't it? It's super cool. I'm uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the experience yeah. and uh, getting to know some of the other authors. And um, they've already put out some really great stories. And, you know, what's coming up in the future is exciting, too. So. That's so cool. And it's, and it's, it's yeah. another way to interact directly with readers without going through a, a retailer or a publisher. It's direct, which is... A much more efficient way to do things sometimes. You know, we we, we aim to please at the, the HEA Collective. Fabulous. Um, yeah, it's cool. There's different subscription tiers too. So, um, you know, it, I like to think it's it fits every budget, yep. whatever, you're, uh, whatever you're looking for. Where can people find you if you wish to be found? It's okay if you don't. Yeah. <laughs> if you'd like to find author me, uh, a, my best place to go is my website. Um, that is kellyfarmerauthor.com. Mm-hmm. That's kind of one-stop shopping. I've got links to my socials. There's info on all the books. There are content warnings, buy links, all that fun stuff. Um, but if you want to find me on social media, Twitter is the best. And I am at Kelly Farmer Auth, A-U-T-H, because Twitter didn't give me two more letters to yeah. finish that off. <laughs> yeah, I, I've had that problem too. <laughs> well, thank you so much for doing this interview. It has been an absolute delight. And congratulations thank again you. on your upcoming book. Thanks. And thank you so much. I've, I've been a fan of the podcast for many years. Oh, so thank you. This is like, it's like bucket list author item. Thank you. It's very exciting. I, I, try to, I try to maintain a fun to listen to uh, production. So yes. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you again to Kelly Farmer for hanging out with me. And of course, I will have links to all of the books that we talked about and links to Kelly's website and the Happily Ever After Collective in the show notes at smartbitchestrashybooks.com slash podcast. As always, I end with an absolutely dreadful joke and I would never leave you hanging without one. This one comes from Maggie and her door of jokes, which is nearly a year ago now. Wow, where is where is time? What even is it? I don't I have no idea. So, are you ready? What says, now you see me, now you don't. Now you see me, now you don't. Give up? What says, now you see me, now you don't. Now you see me, now you don't. A snowman in a crosswalk. (laughs) Do you have snow yet? It's too early for snow here, but that absolutely made me extremely happy. (laughs) 
<laughs> Thank you, Maggie. On behalf of everyone here, we wish you the very best of reading. We hope you have a wonderful weekend and we will see you back here next week. Smart Podcast Trashy Books is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find outstanding podcasts to subscribe to at frolic.media slash podcasts.